everything. So great to be with you today. We have a full house here and some developing issues to talk to the congressman about as well. And that includes what Washington and local elected leaders are doing to get you out of our awful traffic gridlock. Mass transit improvements are stalled pretty much in Miami-Dade, in Broward, in Miami-Dade. A long-time promise of rail expansion never happened. Now the focus is shifting to a plan for rapid bus service. In Broward, a public-private partnership expanded 595, one of the only routes relieving the county's east-west traffic crunch. And a plan for streetcar service in Fort Lauderdale called The Wave. That has yet to happen, and some are wondering if it ever will. It takes money, and that is where Congressman Mario diaz Bullard comes in. He is the go-to guy for federal highway funds. He is a Republican from Miami who chairs the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development. Good morning to you. Great to be here. For being here. We're so glad you're here. You are responsible, in a way, for the legacy of Congressman Bill Lehman, the late Bill Lehman, who brought millions, billions of dollars to South Florida, and now you, through hard work, are doing the same. But what about money now for mass transit? We simply can't build enough highways. We have to have man tr mass transit. Systems. You have to have mass transit. It's got to be part of the solution, part of the mix. Now, I will tell you, I'm blessed to chair that committee. Put me in the same phrase with uh, Bill Lehman is something that, to me, is a, is a great honor, obviously. Um, so I chair that subcommittee. And even though, for example, the administration wanted to cut the funding, for future mass transit uh, projects, we are not doing that. We're funding it. And, and so the question is, will Miami-Dade County have projects that go through the local process, the MPO, the, all of the regulatory process, so that it can get to me? Um, I make decisions with my colleagues as to what gets funded, and it's a little frustrating that none of the projects from Miami-Dade ever get to me because obviously uh, they're still in, uh, in, in the planning phrases. All right, well, in our next segment, as a matter of fact, that's going to be one of the topics with the commission chair who is here, who you met with in Washington Correct. this week. Anything out of that meeting? Any, any money coming from that meeting? Well, I will tell you, uh, Chairman Bovo is a, is a breath of fresh air. Um, he, he gets it, he understands that we have to do uh, projects, he understands what it takes to get them done. Uh, there has been a lack of consensus in the county, and, and I'm thinking, I think he's trying to get that, uh, change that, and he's working with the local mayors and the MPO, et cetera. It's a Herculean task. If anybody can get it done, it's Steve Bovel. But again, my frustration is that while we have had the money, and there's federal money available, even though it's tight budget years, years there is still uh, federal money available. Uh, Dade County has never had a project sent up to me where I can, therefore, uh, try to help fund Mayor Carlos Jimenez was here last week, and Glenna and I were talking with him about transportation, traffic, what is being done, and he now has done about a 180. He is saying no longer is expanding metro rail, mass transit the way to go. He wants rapid bus systems. What do you know about a rapid bus system, and is it a feasible way to go? In some areas, absolutely. In some areas, it could be light rail. In some areas, even heavy rail. And obviously, rail is a lot more expensive and a lot less, a lot more rigid. You can't change things once, you, once you've put them up. Um, so again, when you're looking at what Dade County is looking at, they're looking at six different corridors, uh, and there are potentially different alternatives for those corridors. It's not up to the federal government, in my view, to dictate to the local communities what their priorities should be, what their right. means they should you, be. They bring you the priorities. Yes, yeah. but, but the urgency is that I would like to have the ability to be helpful with federal funding. For that to happen, obviously, the local plan has to come together. Sounds like you're almost sending a subliminal message out there. Well, Glenn, it hasn't been that subliminal. I've had, uh, I've, I've, in some instances, have been, have, been pretty, have been pretty brutal about telling them, come on, to get me something that's real, that's that's legitimate that I can help fund. You know what I think we heard last week in our conversation with the mayor is that there is a real concern that any money is being spent now on whatever kind of plan will be outdated in a couple of years because of the ever-changing technologies happening so quickly. On the federal level, is that a concern and, and how that's almost like a, a stopgap, a hindrance sure. to worry so much about the perfect at the expense right. of the good. I actually, we had hearings on that, and, and there's no doubt the technology is is just you know just going crazy, right? And so we actually put in the in the budget in the bill that I just passed a couple of weeks ago out of the, out of the full committee, we put some serious money for the development and technology and research on what's coming and how to deal with it. 
However, in those same hearings, I asked the question, should we just wait for the new technology or is rail going to be an obsolete thing? And the answer pretty much unanimous was, was, was no. There are always, there's always going to be the need for some traditional technology. Um, but with a new technology, you can supplant or help actually uh, build around those more traditional forms of te technology. But here's a, the, 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 my bottom line. Whether it's different technology, whether it's buses, whether it's rails, I would like the county to finally get us projects. Because I, imagine how frustrating it is for me. I'm constantly, in essence, making decisions, okay, we're going to fund that project in California, that project in Ohio. And with the need that we have here, nothing gets to us. Is that, though, um, you represent a portion of Miami-Dade, but on, you know, in a bigger picture, we have uh, Commissioner Chip Lamarca from Broward will also be yep. joining us for the yep. next segment. And there is no border demarcation on heavy congestion. And so That's a right. regional mass transit and regional transportation is such an important component. How, how does that play for federal dollars? Where Who has to go and bring those projects? Is that sort of a... MPO, Metropolitan Planning It does have to go through the MPO, the local planning process, the environmental process, the engineering process, and eventually it gets to, hopefully it'll get to the federal level. Once it gets to the federal level, that's when I can be very helpful. You know, and, 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 and I'm blessed uh, because of the folks in, in, in this community that, that have allowed me to do this. When we had that crisis with the homeless uh, situation here, because right. of the position that my colleagues up there have put me in, I was able to fund that huge gap. And so I'm in a position to be helpful, but I cannot be helpful if we don't have a local consensus. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on, if we can, to a subject near and dear to your heart and to all of us in South Florida, and that is Venezuela. Venezuelans are voting today on whether to create a constituent assembly which would rewrite their constitution. Right. Just two weeks ago, <laughs> seven and a half Venezuelans, including 100,000 here, Correct. voted no, we don't want to rewrite the constitution. Yes. What happens if, they, if Maduro and his government go forward? Well, what is happening is that the Maduro regime is trying to eliminate any sort of democratic institutions that are left. The, the, the concept of free press no longer exists in Venezuela. You know, the, there are hundreds of political prisoners, but there is the parliament that was elected by the majority of the Venezuelan people, but it's, even though it's the majority, they are, they are, it's the parliament in opposition. So now Maduro is trying to get rid of the parliament. You're absolutely right. The people of Venezuela have spoken. They've said, we do not want this. We do not want this change. The question is, he's moving forward. The regime is moving forward with eliminating, in essence, the parliament. That's really what he's doing. What will the response be of the United States and the international community? What you're seeing from the United States in a total bipartisan way in Congress and with the new administration is, is that we're not going to just sit back and allow the Venezuelan people's rights to be trampled. Yeah, but what about sanctions on oil? That is really the big stick Correct. <clears throat> the United States have has 50% uh, of the oil exported by Venezuela Correct. comes to the United States. And if that were cut off, it would be a huge sanction, but it would be such a disruption, it could bring down the Maduro government. Who knows what right. would replace it? Well, and that's, and that's obviously some, some people are, are concerned about that. We're all concerned about it. There gets to the point, though, where, the, where it's so chaotic right now that you can't get much worse, right? Now, that's another option that the administration has, is dealing with oil, also dealing with the U.S. banking system. There's ways to, to, to make it much more difficult for Venezuela. So far, what the, what, uh, the, the, the Trump administration has done it has focused the sanctions but they've been very clear and they have bipartisan support that if in fact the Venezuelan regime continues to eliminate all vestiges of, of freedom and that the, the you're gonna see a, a seriously ratcheted uh, a ratcheting up of, of, uh, of the sanctions against the Venezuelan government those sanctions and I, I know you had a press conference with your colleague Senator Marco Rubio right. Ileana Ross Layton Correct. representative from Miami um, those sanctions have been ramped up, but really sanctions, very similar sanctions targeting individuals have been in place for a couple of years, Correct. apparently have done nothing. They've done something because they've been ramped up rather dramatically by the administration in the White House now. The question is, are, is that going to be enough? And I, I wish that was the case. I don't believe that that will be enough. I think the sanctions are going to have to be more severe, more widespread. Uh, and, and when we'll see what, uh, what the administration puts forward. What I can tell you, and this is different in the last few years, there were some people in Congress that supported Chavez. That has just totally eroded. There's no support for the Venezuelan regime uh, within the U.S. Congress in a bipartisan way. Now, Congressman, before we run out of time, I need to ask you, we have seen a week 
we say this every week, mm -hmm. like no other week in Washington, Reince <laughs> Priebus pushed out. Correct. You know, Sean Spicer loses his job. John Kelly comes in, announcements about transgender mm -hmm. people no longer going to be mm -hmm. in the military. Um, and on and on. How do you, how, do, how does Congress keep its focus and do its work in light of all of this, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, as my Jewish friends would say, Michigas. Yeah, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of noise out there, right? A lot of distractions in the House. And, and again, you know, while we have some frustration that the Senate has not been able to get a lot done yet, the House, we've, if you look at our record, we've actually gotten things done. We've passed, there's about over 200 bills that are just kind of lingering in the Senate. And what we have to do is get, is stay focused on the big issues. And you know what the big issue for me is? Obviously, U.S. national security, but also getting this economy uh, going. And we're not, I'm not satisfied with less than 2% growth. That's the goal. That's what the House is doing. And we hope that yeah. we can just kind of break through all that noise. And very quickly, the health care vote in the Senate, you probably were up at 1 a.m. watching it. You <laughs> voted for the House version. Correct. Uh, is there a chance now that this goes back to a more bipartisan, collegial, compromise targeted session in Congress and yeah. get something done? Lena, you know that my style, I get things done because I work across party lines. I wish that were the case, but on health care from both Republicans and Democrats, that it's become a, a very uh, partisan issue, politicized issue. My fear is that there are millions of people in, in the United States, including in the area that I represent, that depend on yeah. Obamacare. Yes. They're not going to have it. Obamacare is collapsing. Rates are going to continue to increase. So while the House bill was imperfect, it was better, and it is better, than a, a collapsing Obamacare situation where, again, people are going to be left with nothing. I hope we can address it. Having a bipartisan consensus, uh, gosh, I hope so. Um, but you, I'm not exceedingly optimistic. You don't sound optimistic. No. Congressman Mario Diaz-Balart, great to have you come in. Thanks very much. Always a privilege. Up next.